Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazar, and the subject today we are studying is Cambridge O Levels uh, Physics 5054. The paper uh, we are going to attempt today is a very important paper because this is a specimen paper. Uh, this is specimen paper one. The paper is about MCQs. The course physics 5054 there are few new topics added into this uh, uh, this subject and from the may june 2023 exam those new topics will be assessed so this is uh, one of the specimen papers uh, which is issued by the uh, cambridge and so we are going to attempt this uh, paper today so this syllabus is going to be assessed uh, from the May, June 2023, Physics 5054. Okay, so uh, it's a multiple choice question paper. The, the total marks of the paper are still 40. The time allowed is uh, one hour. There will be 40 MCQs. So uh, 40 MCQ questions. Uh, the new topic which is added, uh, which is uh, stars, galaxies, uh, solar system, that will be assessed in this paper also. So we will get an idea that what kind of questions will come from uh, those topics. Um, especially another topic is, a new topic is added, which is uh, momentum. The product of the mass and the velocity, that is also added. Okay, so... Uh, so you will get very few questions uh, related to these topics. So this is one of those paper, papers which have those topics in it. So uh, let's start. And I hope that you will learn from it. It's a very important paper right now. So let's start today's uh, paper. So we are going to the paper. Okay, so the paper coming up. Okay, so this is the Cambridge Assessment International Education. This is a paper one about the multiple choice, and this is a specimen paper, and this is for the examination from the 2023. The time allowed is one hour, and here we go. The first question coming up on your screen. It says, a small cylinder is rolled along a ruler and completes two full turns as shown in the diagram. So the length which it has covered, that is equals to the two circumferences. Remember this, because it has completed two revolutions. So the linear length which is covered, that is equals to two circumferences of this cylinder. What is the circumference of the cylinder? So uh, the, the roller started from here, which is 1.4. And when the two revolutions were completed, it was on 10.2. So from 10.2 minus 1.4, so whatever you will get, that length is equal to the two times the circumference. Their question is, what is the circumference? I have solved it. Okay, so 10.2 minus 1.4, that will be 8.8 .8 and uh, centimeter. So I told you because the, the roller, the cylinder has completed two revolutions. So this distance is equal to two circumferences of that cylinder. So two circumferences equals to 8.8 .8 centimeters. So circumference, one circumference will be equals to 8.8 .8 divided by two, and that will be 4.4 .4 centimeter. So the circumference, the question was, what is the circumference of the cylinder? So that is 4.4 .4 centimeters. So we think A is the choice. So our, our idea is A is the choice. So let's check our, th we think that A is the choice. Here we have the, this is the marking scheme for that specimen paper for examination from 2023. So it's marking scheme we have here. So it says A, A is the right choice, sir. Okay, so next question, question number two, which diagram shows the vector addition of four Newton force and a three Newton force? You see here, the two forces are, we have three Newton, four Newton. And we want to add them. If you look at the options given, he's using triangle. So I am looking for the triangular law. So what is the triangular law? In the triangular law, it's like head and tail rule for the two vectors. You put one vector on its head, you put the tail of the second vector. 
It's very important. So you take first vector, whether you take the four Newton or you take three Newton, does not matter. But you take first vector, for example, I take four Newton. And on the head of that vector, I put the tail of the second vector. And then I join the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. That will be the result. Okay, so just leave A, A because A is the answer. Let's look at the B. Okay, this is four, okay. On its head, he has put the tail of the second vector. Okay, now the resultant he's showing is this. This is wrong. Why? Because the resultant is when you join the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. So this direction is not right. So B is not the answer. So C, C is not the answer because you see four and three, which are to be added by triangular law. And he has put them in such a way that their tails are joined together. When you put the two vectors, um, and like you put them in such a way that the tails are joined and you make a triangle, in your mathematics, you have studied that this is a subtraction. So this line basically represents not their addition, it represents their subtraction. So C is not the choice. Here in the D is totally wrong because you see the four and three, which are to be added by triangular law. He has put them in such a way that their heads are joined with each other. That is wrong. Addition is not done like this. Okay. So now come to A. He has put here the vector four Newton. And on the head of this vector, he has put the tail of the second vector, which is three Newton. And then he has joined the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. So that is your addition, perfect addition by the triangular law. So A, I think A is the right choice. So question number two, A is the right choice, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says, question number three, the diagram shows the speed time graph for an object moving with the constant acceleration. What is the distance traveled in the first four seconds? It's a distance time graph. And when you have a distance time graph, you can find the distance traveled by calculating the area under the speed time graph. So area under the speed, this is the speed time graph, area under the speed time graph is this, and this is in the shape of a triangle. So I can find the area of this triangle and that will be equal to the distance traveled. You know, the area of the triangle is one by two into base into height. The base is four and the height of this triangle is six. So let me show you, I have done this. Okay, so uh, one by two base into height, one by two, the base is four and the height is six. So it will be 12 meters. So the distance is 12 meters. So I think uh, C is the right choice. Question number three, C is the right choice. Okay, question number four coming up on your screen. An astronaut travels to Mars. Which road describes how his mass and his weight compare with their sizes on Earth? You see... If you will go to the Mars, the, there will be no difference in the mass because the mass does not depend upon the location. It does not depend upon the value of the G on that location. The mass will remain the same. However, the weight, obviously, on the Mars, the value of the gravitational field strength is different. So that's why the, the weight will be different there, but the mass will be the same. So the mass should be the same and the weight should be different. So I think uh, mass will be same and the weight will be uh, different. So I think C looks the good option to me. Question number four, C is the right choice? Yes, sir. C is the right choice. Uh, which, question number five, which object has the largest resultant force acting on it? Here, 20 Newton to the left, 30 Newton to the right. So the resultant will be 10 Newton to the right. Here, 10 Newton to the left, 20 Newton uh, to the right side. So the resultant will be 10 Newton to the right. Here, 30 Newton to the left, 10 Newton to the right. So the resultant force will be 10, 20 Newton to the left. Here, the resultant, there are all the forces are towards the left. So the resultant force will be 15 newtons to the left. So 
the question was which object has the largest resultant force acting on it so the resu result the largest resultant force acting on it will be here 20 newton acting towards the left so i think c has the largest uh, uh, resultant force question number five c is the choice c is the choice okay so here we have a tractor pulls a trailer at a constant speed this word is very important highlight this word a tractor pulls a trailer at a constant speed the tractor exerts a force of 1600 newton to forwards on the trailer what force is exerted by the trailer on the tractor because the tractor is going tractor and trailer both they are going on a constant speed which means the resultant force is zero the resultant force is zero when the forward backward force they are equal to each other so it means if the forward force is 1600 newton the backward force should also be 1600 newton its direction should be backwards so what force is exerted by the trailer on the tractor it will be exerting 1600 newton force in the backward direction so i think b is the right choice question number six b is the right choice question number six b is the right choice sir a question seven a sky diver is falling at terminal velocity which road describes the acceleration of the sky diver and the velocity of the sky diver you see um underline this word Terminal uh, velocity means that uh, uh, the terminal velocity means that it's go falling down at a constant speed. He's, so when you are falling down at a constant speed, your acceleration becomes zero and your velocity becomes constant. So the acceleration will be zero and uh, the velocity will be constant. So I think C is the right choice. C is the right choice. That was question number seven. I think C is the right choice. C is the right choice, sir. Question number, the next question coming up on our screen is question number eight. Which car experiences a resultant force that is not zero? Okay. He's not saying zero. He's saying not zero. Okay. So the car should be accelerating. A car moving along a straight horizontal road at a constant speed, so the direction is not changing, the speed is not changing, so that is not where the resultant force is zero. A car moving around a bend at constant speed, this is 100% possible because when you are uh, turning in a bend, um, it means you're taking a turn in a, at a corner, so your direction is changing. So due to the change in the direction, there will be acceleration, although your speed is constant. So B can be the answer. A car moving up a hill at a constant velocity, it will have uh, a resultant force. It will, its, its resultant force might be zero because of the constant velocity. The car that is at rest, its resultant force is also zero. So B is the best option because when you move in, a, uh, when you are moving around a bend, you are moving actually in a circle. So when you move in a circle, although your velocity, your uh, sorry, I said velocity, your speed is constant, but your direction is changing. So the, why your direction is changing? Because there will be some resultant force and that resultant force is called the centripetal force, uh, which acts towards the center of that uh, circular track. And it is due to the friction between the tires and the road. So question eight, I think B B seems to be the right answer, sir. The B is the right answer. Question number nine. A car is designed to be stable. Where must the center of gravity of the car be? You see, if you want anything to be more stable, uh, the center of the gravity must be lower. It should be near the ground. More it is uh, near the ground, the more the thing will be stable. So above the front wheels, above the rear rear wheels, it does not matter. As high in the car as possible, no. As low in the car as possible. Yes, that's the perfect sentence. 
So I think uh, the best answer given is D choice. Question number nine, D is the right choice, sir. Okay, so the diagram shows a block being pulled up a ramp by a force. So uh, this force is along this ramp. And this block is going upward. So if it goes upward, it will cover a distance PR along the ramp. The vertical height it will gain will be QR. Their question is, uh, their question is, the block has weight W and the rope is pulled up, uh, pulled with the force F. The block moves distance PR and is raised through the height QR. What is the equation for the work done on the block by the rope? Okay, in this case, the work done can be calculated in two ways. One way of calculating the work done is that you have applied the force in the along the ramp. So if you know the distance moved along the ramp, you multiply that force with that distance, you get the work done. So famous formula for the work done, the work done is force multiply the distance moved in the direction of the force. That's the famous formula. Another way, in a lot of times we do that calculation also, is the work done is equals to the gain in the potential energy. And that is weight multiply the vertical height. So uh, the vertical height gained here is QR. So there can be two options. One, the force multiply the distance PR, that can be work done. And, or the other way, the work done is equal to the gain in the potential energy. And that will be the weight multiply QR. So let's see what we have in the options. Okay, what is the equation for the work done on the block by the rope? The force F multiply the distance PR, that's the perfect formula. The force F multiply the height QR. No, 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 not that. Weight multiply the distance PQ. No, weight should be multiplied with the vertical height gained. The gain in the gravitational potential energy. So C is wrong. B is also wrong. D, weight multiply the distance PR. That is also wrong. So A is the right choice. Question number A, I think A is the best uh, uh, answer right now i think so it will be a choice question number 10 i think a is the right choice sir question number 10 a is the right choice so let me show you the whole question so you can if you want to reconsider this okay question number now we have question number 11 he says uh, which uses a non renewable energy source so they are talking about non-renewable energy source. A geothermal heating system, geothermal, you know, is a renewable energy source. Nuclear power station, nuclear uh, fuel is uh, non-renewable. So B can be the answer. A solar panel, solar energy is renewable. A wind turbine, wind is also renewable. So their question was, which is non-renewable? So I think B is the best option, sir. 11, B, our answer is right. Which expression gives the efficiency of an AC generator? You see, AC generator produces electricity. So uh, its output is electric energy. So the formula for the efficiency is useful output energy divided by total input energy. Okay, so that's the formula. So the formula should be useful output electric energy divided by the total input energy. A option is electric energy output divided by the total energy input. A looks the best option right now. It's, it's the right answer. Uh, B, electric energy output divided by thermal energy output. That's wrong. Uh, total energy output divided by electric energy input. That is also wrong. Thermal energy output divided by total energy input. Thermal energy is not the, the, the main theme of the uh, generator. The main work of the generator is to produce electricity. The heat produced is a waste of energy. Electric energy output divided by the total energy input. A is the best option, sir. 
Uh, I think uh, A is the right option. Question number 12, A is the right option. Uh, mercury in a liquid. Question number 13, mercury in a liquid. The diagram shows a simple mercury barometer. Which height is a measure of the atmospheric pressure? You see, when you use uh, this mercury barometer, in this mercury barometer, uh, the height of the mercury, which represents the atmospheric pressure, Pressure is the the level of the mercury in the tray and the level of the mercury in the tube. So that height basically represents the atmospheric pressure. So here, I think C is the right choice. 13, C is the right choice. Th C is the right choice. Uh, question number 14. A gas is in a sealed container of constant volume. So the volume is not changing. The distance between the molecules is not changing. So the distances between one side of the container and the other side of the container is not decreasing. The gas is heated and the pressure of the gas on the wall of the container increases. So how do the particles of the gas cause this increase in the pressure? You see, when you have the volume is not changing, volume is constant the you are heating the gas so when you heat the gas the, the the molecules of the gas the particles of the gas they start moving faster so their kinetic energy increases so their collision frequency uh, with the walls of the container that will increase because they are moving faster so the collision frequency will increase plus because their kinetic energy is more now when they will collide with the wall of the container they will exert more force so the pressure of the gas will increase so how does the particle of the gas cause this increase in the pressure? They expand. The molecules don't expand. They heat each other more frequently. They heat each other. Uh, they heat with each other. That has no effect on the gas pressure. We are talking about the heat with the walls of the container, not heat with each other. They heat the container. They heat the container walls more frequently. Yeah, that can be the answer. They vibrate faster. They do not vibrate. They move randomly throughout the container. They hit the container walls more frequently. That is the best sentence, which is telling that how the... Question 14, C is the option. I think C is the option. The C is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next, uh, next question. The next question coming up on your screen is question number 15. A person cannot open a glass jar which has a metal lid. After the lid is held under hot water for a few seconds, the jar opens easily. So basically what happens? When you put the jar under the hot water, the lid under the hot water, when the hot water falls on that lid, the metal expands. And obviously the jar will expand also, but the jar will expand a little later. Before that, the, the lid will expand. And when the lid will expand, you can easily open it. So what is the explanation for this? The glass jar contracts. The glass jar will not contract. The glass jar expands. Yes, it expands, but little later. The metal lid contracts. No, you are pouring hot water on it. The metal lid expands. Yes, the metal lid expands. The glass jar also expands. But first, the metal lid expands. And you can open it. When the glass jar will also start, start expanding, then it will again difficult to open it. So I think the best uh, explanation is D. Uh, the metal lid expands. D, 15D. 15D is the right answer, sir. So question 16 showing up on your screen. The more energetic particles escape from the surface of uh, from the surface of a liquid which term describe this process condensation evaporation melting radiation okay so you see uh, the particles with the higher kinetic energy when they come to the surface of the liquid they overcome the intermolecular forces they overcome the atmospheric pressure and they go into the atmosphere that process is called evaporation so they are talking about evaporation. Question 16, B looks the right answer to me. Okay, so B is the right answer, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. And the next question is about a ship. Okay, 
So we are talking about a ship. The depth of the sea under a, under a ship is determined by sending a pulse of sound with a frequency of 3000 hertz from a transmitter on the bottom of the ship to the seabed. The sound reflects from the seabed and returns to a receiver on the bottom of the ship. The time between sending the pulse and receiving the reflected pulse is measured. The depth of the sea beneath the ship is 600 meter and the time measured is 0 0.80 second. What is the wavelength of this sound in the sea? Okay, so the frequency of the sound is uh, 3000 hertz and the uh, distance traveled by the sound wave, the sound wave went down and then came back. So it goes down 600 meters and then comes back 600 meters. So it means the total distance covered by the sound is 1200 meters. And this was done in 0 0.80 seconds. So we can find the speed of this sound wave and uh, the formula will be the distance divided by the time taken. And the distance is 1200 meters and the time taken is 0 0.80 second. And so once you know the um, so the speed will be equals to 1200 divided by 0 0.80 seconds. That will be 1500 meters per second. Then we can use the equation of the wave. And that is V equals to F lambda. We know the V is 1500 and the frequency is 3000 and lambda is quotient, which is wavelength. So the lambda will be 1500 divided by 3000 and that will be 0 0.50 meter. 0 0.50 meter. 0 0.50 meter. I think uh, C is the right option, sir. Question number 17, C is the right option. Question number 17, C is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next uh, question. And the next question is 18. Question number 18. A light is incident on a mirror and is reflected as shown. Okay. So the light, uh, this is the incident ray, this is the reflector ray, this is the normal, this is the mirror. And they have uh, uh, prolonged the incident ray, so this will be a straight line, okay? What is the angle of incidence and what is the angle of reflection? You know, this will be the angle of incidence, this will be the angle of reflection. And this whole angle is 80 degree, because this is a straight line, if you remember your mathematics. The sum of the adjacent angles on a straight line is equals to 180. So if this angle is 80, so this whole angle will be 180 minus 80 and that will be 100. So because the angle of incidence, angle of reflection, they both are equal to each other. So this angle, which is 100, if you divide into two equal parts, then 100 divided by 2, that would be 50, 50. It means that the angle of incidence is 50 and the angle of reflection is also 50. So I think... Uh, D is the right answer, sir. Question number 18, D is the right option. I hope you understand the mathematics and the angle properties which are used. In your mathematics, you have learned this. Okay, uh, question number 19. An object O is placed in front of a lens. The ray diagram shows the path of the two rays that start at the tip of the object. Which point P or Q is a principal focus and what type of image is formed? You see, this ray passed through the optical center. Obviously, any ray which passes from the optical center do not deviate. It goes undeviated, okay? So, uh, but this ray, this ray, look at this ray, it is diverged uh, because it's parallel to the principal axis. After passing through the lens, it has diverged. So when this happens, that means this lens is basically a diverging lens. So if this lens is a diverging lens, then I can, I can prolong this, uh, this emergent ray and when it will cut the principal axis, that will be my principal focus. So let me show you. I've done that. Hopefully you can see that. 
you see uh, what we have done in this uh, this the, after diverging this was the way i have prolonged it behind the lens and it cut the principal axis at the point p that means that the principal focus is at the point p the f the principal focus f you remember that is on the p and the image is where these two rays the red one and this black one they intersect so in the image is here the image formed by a diverging lens is always a virtual image so uh, let's see what are the options so the principal focus is p and the type of the image will be virtual i think uh, without looking anything the principal focus will be at the p and the virtual uh, the image formed will be virtual. The diverging lens always make virtual image. Remember. So I think question number 19B looks the best option, sir. Question number 19B is the right option. Question number 20 is showing up on your screen. A sound wave travels through the air. The lines in the diagram show the positions of the particles of air at one particular time. Which distance is the wavelength of the wave? You see, the wavelength will be from the middle of the refraction to the, the the next refraction or from the middle of a compression to the middle of the next compression. Okay. Look at the B. This is the middle of the rarefaction. And this is the middle of the rarefaction, the next rarefaction, obviously. So the distance between them, that represents one wavelength. So B is the best option looking, I can tell you. <laughs> This is not, this is not, this is not. The wavelength is uh, the center of the rarefaction to the next rarefaction, its center, I mean. Or it can be the center of the compression and the next compression to its center, okay? So we think 20B is the right option. Question number 20B is the right option. Okay, so... Question number 21. The diagram shows an electromagnet. How can the strength of the electromagnetic magnetic field around the electromagnet be increased? You can increase the voltage of the DC power supply. You can reduce the uh, resistance of the this variable resistor. So the current will increase in the circuit. So either you increase the, uh, you know, the power of the DC power supply, or you increase the current flowing in the circuit, or you increase the number of turns of the coil per unit length. So he says remove the metal core and decrease the current. No, both these things will decrease the electromagnet strength. Remove the metal core and keep the current in the circuit constant. No, by removing the metal core, the magnet will become weaker. Reverse the DC supply. Reversing the DC current has no effect. Supply, the de supply and decrease the current in the circuit decreasing the current that will decrease the strength of the magnet reverse the dc supply and increase the current in the circuit yes this is the answer you see reversing the current has no effect on the strength of the magnetic field only um, polarity will change uh, increasing the current yes that will increase reversing the direction has no effect on the strength so I think question 21D is the choice. Question number 21D is the right choice, sir. Okay, so next question is, what material can a temporary magnet be made from? The temporary magnets are normally made from the soft iron. So plastic, no. Steel, no. Wood, no. Steel is used to make permanent magnets. So I think B is the right choice. Question number 22B is the right choice, sir. Okay, so the diagram shows an uncharged ball covered with metallic paint. The ball is suspended from an insulating thread. It is placed near a positively charged rod. So what will happen? This is positive. So the right side of this ball, that will become negative. And the left side of this ball will become positive. This negative and positive, they will be equal to each other. So the right the right side should become positive. Oh, sorry, negative. It's a positive. It should be negative. So 
is the question which diagram shows the best charge distribution on the wall i think uh, that will be uh you see the right side will be negative the left side will be positive negative positive they will be equal to each other the d is the best option question number 23 d is the right option sir question number uh, 24 we have he says a charge he says a charge of uh, 45 coulomb flows through an electric appliance in three minutes what is the average current in the plant? You see the the charge is given. That's 45 coulomb. And the time is three minutes. The time is not taken in minutes. The time should be taken in seconds. And for that, you multiply three with the 60 because in one minute there are 60 seconds. So three multiply 60, that will be 180 uh, seconds. So what is the average current? The formula for the current is charge divided by time. And the time is always taken in seconds in this case. So the charge is given and that is uh, 45 coulomb. The time is three minutes. That will be 180 seconds. I is equals to Q divided by T. So I will be equals to 45 divided by 180 and that will be 0 0.25 ampere. 0 0.25 ampere. 0 0.25 ampere. So we think A is the answer, sir. Question 24A is the right option? Yes. Question number 25. A wire of length 0 0.50 meter and cross-sectional area of 1 x plus minus 6 meter square has a resistance of 0 0.75 ohm. Another wire of the same material, the important thing is same material, so they will have the same resistivity. Another wire of the same material has a length of 2 meter and a cross-sectional area of 0 0.50 uh, and uh, x plus minus 6 meter square. What is the resistance of the longer wire? Okay, so what is the resistance of this second uh, sample? Because both the materials, they are made of the same uh, wire. Material. Both the wires are made of the same material. So they their resistivity will be same. So the resistivity of the one wire and the resistivity of the first wire and the resistivity of the second wire, that will be same. The formula for the resistivity is R1 A1 by L1 and that will be equals to R2 A2 by L2 where the A is the cross-sectional area, L is the length. So we just put the values. R2 is the question 0 0.75 into 1 x4 minus 6 divided by 0 0.5 equals to R2 which is we want to find out 0 0.5 x4 minus 6 divided by 2. So when you make R2 alone, this will go downstairs, this will go upstairs. Okay. So the R2 in your calculator, you will write 0 0.75 multiply 1 x per minus 6 multiply 2 divide 0 0.5 divide 0 0.5 x per minus 6 equals 2. You will get 6 ohm. So 6 ohm. I think uh, D, our calculation says D will be the answer. 25, D is the answer, sir. Question number 25, D is the answer. Okay, now we have the next question. The next question is question number 26 showing up on your screen. Which electric symbol represents a fuse? You see, this is the symbol for the light emitting diode. This is the symbol for the motor. This is the symbol for the lamp. This is the symbol for the fuse. So I think B is the right choice. Question number 26, B is the right choice. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is, okay, here we have. Three identical resistors are joined in series to a battery. Okay, so these, these three resistors, they are identical to each other. So they are connected in series. So on all of them, the voltage drop will be equal to uh, same, same. He says uh, the voltmeter Q, which is uh, measuring the voltage drop across these two, and this is measuring the voltage drop across only one. He says the Q reads eight. It means four volt is taking the him, four volt here, four volt here, and obviously this will also take four volt because they are identical. Okay, the reading on the P that will be also four volt because on the Q it's eight. So because Q is telling you the voltage drop across the two resistors. So if that's totally eight, then it means four here, four here, and four will be here. So on the P, the reading will be four, and the total EMF will be four plus four plus four, and that will be 12. 
So the EMF will be 12 and the reading on the P will be 4. I think uh, B looks the best option to me. Question 27, B is the right option, sir. Question number 28 coming up on your screen. He says the, the EMF of the battery in a radio is 3 volt. The resistance of the circuit in the radio is 6 ohm. The radio is switched on. How much energy is transferred from the battery in 30 minutes? Okay. The voltage is given and, you know, uh, here, the voltage is 3 volt. The resistance is 6 ohm. The time is 30 minutes. The time should be in seconds. So time 30 multiplied 60. So that will be 1800 seconds. You know, according to Ohm's law, V is equals to IR. So I will be equals to V divided by R. So 3 divided by 6, that will be 0 0.5 ampere. So we know how much current is flowing there. The electric energy is formula is IVT. The I will be 0 0.5 ampere. The V will be 3 volt and the time is 180, 1800 seconds. So you multiply them, you get 2700 joules. 2700 joules, that is the answer. 2700 joules is the answer, sir. My calculation says 2700 joules. So I think question number 28, C will be the, oh, C is the answer. This is the calculation which we did. C is the answer. The next question coming up on your screen is question number 29. What is the unit for the energy used by an electric appliance? The energy which is used by an electric appliance, that is kilowatt R. Kilowatt R. So B is the right option. Question 29, B is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next, 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 next question. And okay, oh, oh, oh. so we have to read. Okay, so question number 30, a magnet oscillates vertically a power coil of wire. As the lower end of the magnet oscillates between P and R, a varying EMF is induced across the coil. When this EMF is zero, where could the lower end of the magnet be? You see, when the magnet will move relative to the coil, the EMF will be produced. Remember, EMF will be induced in the coil when the magnet is moving relative to the coil. If the magnet will stop moving relative to the coil, the EMF produced will be, the EMF induced will become zero. So we have to look during this motion, when the when that magnet is vibrating because it's attached with a spring so it's vibrating between p and r so during this motion when it do not move so when the magnet comes to the bottom of the magnet comes to r it stops and then it goes back when the bottom of the magnet goes to p it stops and then again it comes down so at r for a moment it stops at p it for a moment it stops so when it stops it stops moving relative to the coil, the EMF induced will become zero. So at point P and at point R. It's a famous question. So I think C is the right option, sir. Question number 30, C is the right option, sir. Okay, the... Which trans which transformer, question number 31, which transformer arrangement produces an output EMF that is larger than the input potential difference? So they are asking you to find out which diagram represents a step-up transformer. A step-up transformer, all the transformers, they use alternating current. So the diagrams which have the DC input, they are out. DC input is not used in the transformer. We use alternating current. So the competition is between them. The step-up transformer will be that in which the, the secondary coil has more turns as compared to the primary coil. This, this secondary coil has more turns as compared to the primary. So this is a step-up transformer. This one is a step-down transformer. So B is the right option, sir. 31B is the answer. 31B is the right answer, sir. So we are going to the next question. The next question is question number 32. Why is a relay 
used in a switching circuit. Relay is used to, by using a small current and small voltage in the relay. You can switch on and off a circuit who has a large amount of current and large voltage. That's the basic theme function of the relay. To switch on a small current using a small current, no. To switch on a small current using a large current, no, no, no. To switch on a large current using a small current, yes. This is the this is the basic, 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 basic. To switch on a large current using a large current, no. C, C is, I think that C is the right answer, sir. So I think C is the right option. Uh, that's the main, uh, uh, this was question was 32. 32 C, C is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are on question number 30, I think 33. Yeah, okay. It says a horizontal beam of electrons passes between the two poles of a magnet in a vacuum. In which direction is the beam deflected? Okay, so we have a charged particle, but this is electron. And we are going to use the left-hand rule. And if you want to use the left-hand rule, the method is very simple. You see what we will do. So this is my left hand. And because I'm using the front mirror, maybe you, you, you feel that it's not my left hand, but this is my left hand. Okay, so F, M, C, F, M, C. This is the left hand. Okay. The thumb represents the force. The index finger represents the magnetic field and the middle finger represents the uh, the current. But the current is of uh, conventional current. So, but the electrons, the magnetic field is downward. The magnetic field is downward. The magnetic field is downward. The charged particle is going in this direction. My thumb is pointing into the screen. My thumb is pointing into the screen. Because electrons are going in this direction, the magnetic field is downward, not to south. My thumb pointed in the into the screen. Okay. But this law is not about the negative charges. This law is about the positive charges. So whatever my hand, thumb tell me, the direction of the deflection, of the electrons because they are negatively charged, that will be opposite. That will be out of the screen. So I think out of the page, I think that's the best option. I hope you know what is left hand rule. Uh, that was question number 33. I think B is the option. Question number 33, B is the right option, sir. Okay, back to the size. Okay, okay, okay. I I hope you understand what is left hand rule and left hand rule is used for the conventional current for the positive charges. The so that's why whatever the left hand predicted, we took opposite to that. How many neutrons in one neutral atom of the krypton isotope? So number of neutrons, uh, you know, uh, the proton number is thirty six. Its nucleon number is eighty four. From the nucleon number, subtract the proton number, and you will get the number of neutrons, okay? So the neutrons will be 84 minus 36, that will be 48. So that will be 48. So I think B is the option, sir. Question number 34, B is the right option, sir. Okay, the next question coming up, 35. Carbon 614 represents a nucleide of the element carbon and nitrogen 714 represents a nucleide uh, of the nitrogen of the okay okay we have to reduce the size of the element nitrogen how is a neutral atom of nitrogen 714 different to a neutral atom of carbon 6 and 14 okay so let me show you one thing is very important here. So, um, in this, the protons are seven, the neutrons are seven, the electrons are seven in a neutral atom. Carbon 614, the protons are six, the neutrons are eight, electrons are six. 
Here, the proton number here is one more than the proton number here. Or you, neutron number here is one less than the neutron number here. Electrons, one is here, here is one more than here. Okay. So what are the options they are giving us? The nitrogen has atom has one electron fewer than the carbon atom. Nitrogen atom has one electron fewer than the nitrogen carbon atom. That's wrong. Uh, the nitrogen atom has one neutron more than the carbon atom. One neutron more than the carbon atom. No, that is also wrong. Then he says nitrogen atom has one proton fewer than the carbon atom. One proton. That's wrong. It has one proton more. The nitrogen atom has one proton more than the carbon atom. Here you see one proton is more than the carbon's protons. Oh, so it looks D is the right option, sir. Uh, 35, D is the option. Easy peasy question. Okay, so we are going to the next question. Radioactive isotopes emit three types of radiations. Which list gives the types of radiation in order of their ionizing effect from the greatest to the least? So the radiations which come out, the radiations are of three types, um, alpha, beta, and gamma. So the alpha particle is the most ionizing, then the beta, and then the gamma. Gamma is the least ionizing. So I think this is the right list. Alpha is the highest ionizing, and the least ionizing is gamma, A. 36A is the right option, sir. Uh, which statement about the half-life of a radioactive isotope is correct? Um, half-life is the time duration in which half of a sample of radioactive isotope will decay. Half-life is the time taken for the number of nuclei for the, of the isotope, isotope to half. That can be the answer. D is, looks the best option, sir. I have not yet read what are the A and the B options, but the definition which I know... Half-life is half the time it takes for, half, not half the time. Half-life is half the time, no. Half-life is the time taken for the nucleon number of the isotope to have, no, not the nucleon number. The atoms to become half, they will decay and they will convert into something different. So half-life is the time taken for the number of nuclei of the isotope to have. So I think D is the option, question 37, D is the right option. He says light, question 38, light from the sun. That's uh, that's the new thing. This is the new topic which is added. Question 38 is coming from there. Uh, and that is about orbital speed, okay? The light from the sun travels to the earth at a speed of 3 x per 8 meter per second. The time for the complete journey is 500 seconds. So from here, I can calculate how much is the distance between the sun and the earth. What is the average orbital speed of the Earth in its orbital orbit around the Sun? So the orbital speed, the formula is 2 pi r divided by t. So I should know what is the radius of the Earth, orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So that I can find by speed multiplied time. That's the distance between the Sun and the Earth. That is equal to the radius of that orbit. So the distance will be r is equal to 3 expo 8 into 500. So it will be 1.5 expo 11 meter. The orbital speed, the formula, that's the new topic, sir. Pay attention. Orbital speed is uh, 2 pi r divided by t. Here r is the radius of the orbit in which that planet is uh, moving around the sun. So 2 pi r into 1.5 x per 11 divided by the time that Earth takes 30, uh, 365 days to complete uh, uh, one revolution around uh, one circle around the Earth. So, but the time should be taken in seconds. So, 365 multiplied 24 multiplied 3600. That is written in the denominator. So, in your calculator, you will write 2 multiply pi multiply 1.5 x per 11 divided by 365 divided 25, 24 divided by 3600. So, that will give you 29885.7. So, which is approximately uh, 30,000 meter per second. So the orbital speed of the Earth around the Sun is 3 x per 4 meter per second. 3 x per 4 meter per second. 3 x per 4 a meter per second. So I think C is the right choice, sir. 
Oh, she is the right choice. Okay. This next question is also uh, coming from that new syllabus. Uh, the new topics which are added. Solar system and uh, stars. Space, stars, galaxies. In the sun, energy is transferred from an energy store. Which energy is being released and what is the name of the reaction that releases this energy inside the sun? That is called the nuclear energy and the reaction which is happening on the sun. Uh, that is called fusion and smaller nuclei of hydrogen and hydrogen. They combine and they make a larger nucleus that is called fusion. So nuclear energy and the name of the reaction is fusion. So I think D is the right choice, sir. Question number 39, D is the right choice. And the light emitted from a galaxy is red shifted. When detected on that, this is purely new topic. How does the frequency of the light when detected on Earth compares with its frequency when emitted, and is what and in what direction is the galaxy moving away? Is moving. Sorry. Uh, you see, if the something which is emitting light, if it is going away from you, if something emitting light is going away from you gradually the frequency of that light will decrease. If the frequency of that light will decrease, the color of that light will start moving towards the red. So if you see a star, a galaxy, the light reaching you, that is red. So it means that its frequency is decreasing. Frequency of that light is decreasing. That's why its color is red. And that shows that the that thing is going away from you. So we think that the, the frequency of the light when detected on Earth, its frequency is less than the frequency of the light which was originally emitted. So it's less than the frequency of the emission. And that means that the thing is going away from the Earth. Is the answer, sir. It's a new topic. Hopefully, you will study with your teachers. I will also try to work on this these topics. And uh, so, you see, the last uh, let let's check first of all. Forty A, forty A is the right option. So, this question number forty, the question number thirty nine, and the question number thirty eight. So, they were from the new syllabus. Okay. So this is this was the specimen paper issued by the um, the Cambridge on their website. Uh, for this will be used for the uh, it's a specimen paper for those exams which are starting from the May June two thousand twenty three because there are some changes um, in the syllabus of the physics five zero five four. So hopefully you have learned from this paper, and my dear students, if you have learned from this paper uh, please uh, like this video also subscribe my channel if you think that this video has helped you and it can help your class fellows please share the link of this video onto your twitter account onto your facebook and onto your instagram because that helps me to promote my channel is i think it's a great blessing for me that i can make these videos which can touch the life of so many students around the globe Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you very much once again. Have a good day. God bless you all.